Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, just to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Desert LCC YouTube channel. It is part of a series of webinars that we're doing related to landscape conservation design, trying to promote learning between different efforts across the country. Uh, today, we have Cynthia Calio Edwards with us. She's the coordinator of the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy. She works through the Wildlife Management Institute, and she's worked in the LCC community since joining the Gulf Coast Prairie Landscape Conservation Co Cooperative as the science coordinator in February of 2013. Um, the Gulf Coast Prairie LCC is our is the desert LCC's neighbor. Um, we're in the same Fish and Wildlife Service region, and um, of course shares some geography um, through Texas as well. Now she works with um, six LCCs and the partners associated in each of those, um, as well as working with the LCC network in the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC. Um, she is working through the Southeast and South Central Climate Science Centers as well and to coordinate CCAS. And CCAS is the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy. Um, Today she will be discussing um, the collaborative conservation effort that's being undertaken through CCAP, which was initiated in 2011. Um, and it's quite an impressive partnership of states and um, different agencies and organizations coming together across a very large landscape. So with that, Cynthia, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, just to let everybody know, we are, um, everybody's on mute, everybody is on mute. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to enter them into the chat box, and we will read them off and answer them along the way. Cynthia? Great. Thanks very much, Genevieve. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad to have been asked to um, speak with you today and uh, looking forward to some good discussion. So as Genevieve mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about the um, collaborative conservation experience that we've um, been uh, on the path towards in the southeast since about 2011. Uh, just a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, I want to back up a little bit and, and talk about why CCAS came to be and, and really what the drivers behind that was. Uh, some of our progress to date, uh, a few examples, uh, the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment, uh, some activity that we did last fall at the CCAS Conservation Leadership Summit that was held in Baton Rouge and then our Blueprint 1.0, which is our first sort of overall map of the southeast. Uh, towards the end of the presentation, I'll talk about some emerging opportunities and kind of then what comes next for CCAS and provide some information on how all of you on the phone and, and listening later on the YouTube video uh, can get engaged in, in this effort or learn more about it. So why, why CCAS? So we're in the southeast, the, the 15 states of the southeast, and we have a lot of um, a lot of urban expansion. I have an agricultural background. This cartoon is one of my favorites, where it demonstrates sort of that we're taking farmland and turning it into houses and and condos and Walmart parking lots and all those fun things. Um, that's really happening at a pretty rapid pace here. Uh, in terms of the emerging mega regions, this is the area we cover. So we've got some substantial ex, um, urban expansion in this area of the country, and that's providing, of course, a lot of challenges uh, for fish and wildlife conservation. This is a photo of, um, so we've got the whole Gulf Coast in this region as well. Gulf of Mexico coast, and uh, this is a photo of the highway that goes into the Isle de Jean Charles uh, Reserve in uh, southwest Louisiana, well, south central Louisiana, I guess, um, and they're experiencing a lot of sea level rise and issues with that, and they're actually going to be moving people uh, further inland because they're not going to be able to rebuild on their traditional lands because of sea level rise. So this is uh, an example of climate refugees right here in the United States. They're moving uh, about 50 people, I think, for a cost of just under $50 million total. So 
it's a very expensive endeavor, and given the rapid rate of um, land loss that we're experiencing in Louisiana, this is not um, definitely not going to be the last one. So we've got those challenges as well. Fire, of course, which is both um, needed to revitalize some of our forest and grassland uh, habitats, but given the population density is, is really very hard to get on the landscape and, and to get permitted to do that and to make sure that everything's lined up in order to have those prescribed fires. Also, given climate change and uh, changes in weather patterns, we've had fire um, that was not welcome on the landscape. These photos are from West Texas earlier this year uh, where they experienced vast wildfires. And then if I had um, been a little more on the ball, I might have shown some photos from Florida, uh, which has a lot of fires burning right now and uh, looks like a, a bad weekend for weather is going to continue to uh, fuel those fires in Florida that are happening right now. So that's another, uh, another issue that we're experiencing. And then one of the things we, we're really proud of in the southeast is our, um, our connection to the land. So it's a great place to live and, and to hunt and fish, and uh, we want to help preserve that as well. So all those challenges plus the, the sort of disruptive changes impacting conservation from the urban patterns that I mentioned, we've got um, renewable energy, uh, wind potential, and solar potential that all, you know, really good for a whole number of reasons can also be detrimental to fish and wildlife conservation efforts as well. We've got, of course, the shale coal beds and Eagle Ford shale in Texas, and then climate change and water stress and all of all of these stressors on the landscape and somewhat different than uh, oops, sorry somewhat different than um, some of the western states this is all being done in a landscape that has about 90 percent plus private land in some states like Texas we're approaching you know upwards of 97 percent private land so there's not a lot of um, opportunities to meet the needs of fish and wildlife on publicly held lands or lands that are held in, in the public trust or with a conservation easement or by an NGO. So uh, a little different in the southeast in that respect as well. So given all of those drivers and, and changes, the, uh, the directors, the state directors of the 15 states in the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies back in 2011 decided that they needed to pull together to really begin to address and identify what we need on the landscape to sustain fish and wildlife resources. So they initiated um, CECUS in the fall of, of 2011. And it was driven by the states originally and then um, added to by the federal agents over the next year. So. Uh, the federal agencies that are engaged are what we call the Southeast Natural Resource Leaders Group. There are 12 uh, federal agencies in that. Um, Cindy Donor out of Fish and Wildlife Service Region 4 is our liaison to that group um, between CECUS and that um, Southeast Natural Resource Leadership Group. The other agencies on the federal side include uh, USDA, the Forest Service, and, and NRCS the Department of Defense, the EPA, um, let's see, BOEM, which is the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, uh, NOAA, um, some of the usual suspects who have a lot of uh, dealing with natural resource issues. So at the same time that the directors were starting to put this together, the landscape conservation cooperatives were just kind of getting started and, and coming on board. So it was identified that that the LCCs could provide that capacity to help actually get this work done on the, on the ground. So it was, um, that's where we get the six LCCs, and I'll, I'll show you those in a minute, the, the ones that are um, primarily engaged and, and some who are on the edges, kind of like the desert LCC. Um, it's also, as Genevieve mentioned, coordinated with the Southeast and South Central Climate Science Centers who provide a lot of that background information for us, the 
urban growth model, for example, that we use in a lot of our planning has come out of that and some of the sea level rise work. And then we also uh, have a really strong partnership with the Southeast Aquatic Resource Partnerships, which is one of the fish habitat partnerships. And of course, given the work um, through the landscape conservation cooperatives, we also get the benefit of the steering committee members on all of those, which is a, a very broad network of partners, uh, NGOs, state agencies, uh, right across the southeast. So this, sort of, this map outlines our uh, geography, so the, the bold outline is this, the 15 states that are in the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Some, like Texas and Oklahoma, are also engaged in the Western Association and uh, Missouri's in both the Southeast and the Midwest, and uh, so there's some overlap. And then this outlines the, the six LCCs that are primarily focused on sort of making CECAS work. So the Gulf Coast Prairie, which as Genevieve mentioned, is, is your neighbor to the east. Uh, the Gulf Coast of Plains and Ozarks, the Appalachian LCC, which is actually administered out of Fish and Wildlife Service Region 5 in the northeast, uh, the South Atlantic, uh, Peninsular Florida, and then the Caribbean. So these white spaces that you'll see, um, that doesn't mean we're not uh, paying attention to those areas, of course, but it's um, sort of those LCCs aren't as fully engaged as uh, the six that are outlined here. So the Great Plains covers um, this north part of Texas and Oklahoma. Eastern Tall Grass Prairies, Big Rivers covers this one. Um, we do work a lot with Gwen White and, and Kelly Myers on things like Gulf hypoxia. And then you've got Virginia over here, which is actually um, covered by three LCCs, the Appalachian, the South Atlantic, and the North Atlantic. So, but that's our geography and kind of the area that uh, that we work in. So it's a big area, pretty diverse, of course, and as uh, I showed earlier, lots of stressors on it. So what what really is CECAS? I'd like to think of it as um, the vision. So it's about diverse partners uh, designing and trying to achieve a connected network of landscapes and seascapes. And I think one of the most important ways to describe that is really, given all those pressures I talked about earlier, we don't want fish and wildlife resources to kind of just get what's left over after everybody else is, is done with their piece. We need to really begin to define what we need that landscape to look like to sustain those fish and wildlife resources that we're interested in. So this is really about the state and federal and NGO partners coordinating our actions and investments uh, to focus on common goals. So how we like to kind of think of it or position it is all of those drivers on the landscape provide challenges, but they also provide unprecedented opportunity for the conservation community to work together to begin to address some of these big long-term issues. So I just want to touch quickly on, on some of the early accomplishments. Uh, this has been sort of underway for, for just over five years. One of the first tangible projects we worked on was the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment, which included uh, work across four of the LCCs on the Gulf Coast. Uh, it was completed in 2015. And really what we looked at here was uh, four different ecosystems and uh, a suite of species. I'll just go through the species here so you can see them. Um, and we looked at the, at the vulnerability of those species across six ecoregions in the, in the Gulf Coast. We, what we used was um, a process uh, developed by Reed Noss and Joshua Reese out of Florida called the Standardized Index of Vulnerability and Value, which basically is this uh, spreadsheet system they developed that enables experts to assess multiple threats and values and prioritize conservation efforts based on those. Uh, so it's basically the ability to quantify um, qualifiable, qualifiable information. So uh, allows you to assimilate a lot of information uh, from ex a multitude of experts over across species uh, and time. So these are the, the systems and the species we looked at in that vulnerability assessment. 
and it really is going to help um, and has been and, and will be continuing to help sort of guide where those priority areas are along the Gulf Coast. So which species are most vulnerable? Uh, Kemp's Ridley sea turtle was the most vulnerable species identified, and tidal emergent marsh was the most vulnerable eco ecosystem, sorry, which um, makes a lot of sense, especially given some of those sea level rise and subsidence issues we're dealing with in the Gulf Coast. Moving on to the, uh, so last fall was the fifth anniversary, so to speak, of um, the initiation of CECAS. So we hosted a large conservation leadership summit uh, in conjunction with the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies annual conference in Baton Rouge. Um, we had great attendance, uh, standing room only. Uh, we had a lot of uh, good conversations. This is uh, Ed Carter. He's our um, He's the executive director of the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency and is our uh, CECAS liaison into the state agencies. Um, this is Cindy Doner. She's uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Regional Director for Region 4, and she provides that conduit to the federal agencies we work with. So as you can see, we had yeah, lots of good folks and, and a lot of good discussion. Uh, really, the summit was designed around three key outcomes we wanted to get. We wanted to reignite some of the excitement about CKIS and, and secondly, affirm uh, the ongoing support from both the state and federal agencies to continue to, to move ahead. Uh, and then we wanted to demonstrate the level and breadth of engagement so far. We spent a good deal of time with um, about 12, I think, of the 15 state directors were represented there and focused a lot on the whole concept of why we need CECAS and reaffirming that we do. And then we got into, uh, you'll see, this is Rua Mordecai from the South Atlantic, got into really the nuts and bolts on the blueprint. So we thought that was really successful. We've um, had some good feedback since, since we did it. This is a quote from Susan Gibson at the Department of Defense, who's been a really good advocate for CECAS, uh, especially given the large number of military installations in the, in the southeast. And uh, because their first priority is not fish and wildlife uh, on those installations, but they also want to do what they can to conserve those resources, our work provides a lot of um, the scientific background that, that they don't have the, we don't want to say they don't have the capacity, but that's not their mandate to do so. Um, so we, um, those blueprint tools, which I'll highlight here in a minute, really do um, provide a lot of information to those folks in a short period of time. And, and we're lucky, uh, Susan's actually working with me right now to submit a proposal to have a CECAS session at the North American Wildlife and Resource Conference next spring in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. So we've had some really good engagement from those federal agencies, and I think our summit last year really help to highlight that again. So this is the blueprint uh, that was rolled out last fall at the, at the CECA summit. You can see it goes beyond the 15 states because some of the northeast work uh, being done out of the Appalachian LCC expands that way, and there's some ongoing uh, linkages with the North Atlantic LCC as well. Um, so I just want to the blue, the dark blue is, represents high priority areas for conservation and restoration. Um, and then the, the blue, uh, lighter blue, uh, represents uh, medium priority. I'll get into some of the caveats here in a, in a few minutes. Um, there's lots. This was um, our first crack at this. And each of the six LCCs took a slightly different approach. The green in this area is just to highlight uh, the existing protected areas. We had a lot of, uh, you know, people saying that the blue seemed like it was too overwhelming. So we thought we'd, for illustrative purposes at least, add the green so you can see that there are some substantial areas um, that are conserved either through um, state or federal parks or, um, but as you can see, there's a lot that isn't, hence my point earlier about the large amount of private land in these areas. And that really does vary by state. Like Florida has um, more public land. I think they're 
75% maybe public land, so they've got um, some different challenges in that. So the blueprint really is a, a living map that shows those shared priorities for conservation and restoration. It integrates those, the blueprints from across the LCCs. And um, those of you who've been in the LCC world for a while and have been engaged in the desert, you know that they're, oh, excuse me, they're self-directed partnerships. So each one in the southeast also took a slightly different approach to how to identify their priorities. And then this really is version 1.0, and there's, there's lots of room for improvement, of course. This is what the really draft version of the blueprint looked like. So I'll just touch on a, a few things here. Uh, the Gulf Coast Prairie looked at um, potential for uh, tall grass prairie and some of the marsh uh, ecoregions to be uh, either conserved or restored. Uh, the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks right here looked uh, focused a lot on the conservation of existing uh, natural areas. That's the reason that the, the Mississippi Alluvial Valley here shows up as white, um, because this particular map doesn't, uh, doesn't focus on restoration, but rather what's already there. The Appalachian LCC did a species richness, biodiversity richness um, scale. The South Atlantic, which was one of the early LCCs, they're actually on version 2.2 or 2.3 of their blueprint. And they also include uh, out to the 200-mile EEZ line here. And then um, Peninsular Florida has a wealth of data as well, um, critical lands and waters uh, that they've been working on in the state of Florida for, a, for some time. And then the, the Caribbean has, has started to identify their priorities as well. Um, they're just kind of, they're one of the newer LCCs as well. So. So when we decided how best to integrate, uh, a lot of this effort was done through the science coordinators of the LCCs. And we looked at um, lessons learned from previous integration efforts at a large scale and, and really focused on engaging the points of contact, so those point people in the state and federal agencies um, who've been tasked with uh, sort of being the CECAS rep for their respective agencies, uh, worked with them to make consensus decisions on what approach to take. So things like the, the uh, level of uh, amount of land we were going to include as high and medium priority. So um, <clears throat> we decided that, that high priority, we could about 30% of the LCC. I didn't want to go any higher than that. And then medium took it up to an additional 20%. And that's kind of on average across the LCCs. Um, so that's what that blue on the, the medium and high priority means. Uh, if you take out the light blue that I showed earlier, you lose a lot of the corridor benefits that might otherwise be captured. And given some of the climate change issues and thresholds and species and ecosystem movement sort of away from the coast and, and to higher elevations, we wanted to make sure that we had identified those corridors because those are going to be, they might be medium, quote unquote, medium priority now, but uh, given some of the climate change predictions, they might become increasingly important. Um, uh, there are areas of overlap, sort of where the edges of the LCCs meet, for example, uh, the panhandle of Florida was covered by three different LCCs. And then, of course, we'll we kind of work on this on a model of continual improvement. So just to, to get into some of a, a more realistic example, so this is the blue that I showed you earlier. Um, but if we begin to look at specific conservation issues, in this case, potential for economic incentives, we can begin to really narrow down that focus and better identify where to, where to work. So this is an example, just an example of potential economic incentives, and then potential economic incentives on cropland. So a thing, few things pop out. This is a very um, important area for rice agriculture, for uh, migratory waterfowl and other bird species. So you can begin to uh, 
as you peel back the layers, so to speak, of the blueprint, you can begin to better identify areas that will suit your specific need. So I mentioned there's a lot of improvement and, and some of the things that have been identified as uh, the caveats right now, and this is kind of what those science coordinators are working on uh, as they strive to provide an update at, uh, later this year at the Seattle conference, so version 2.0 will be rolled out then. Uh, working on better defining the methods that were used and focusing on some of the data sets that were consistently used kind of across the region rather than in an individual LCC. Uh, some of the LCCs have not identified or defined uh, specific outcomes. Uh, that, again, gets back to the, the self-directed nature of the landscape conservation cooperatives and the fact that they've focused on slightly different things and we're trying to roll up those slightly different things. And then the blueprint, as I mentioned, is constantly evolving and, and will be updated annually. We're beginning to um, better incorporate <clears throat> excuse me, future threats like urbanization and sea level rise and need to better define those in future iterations. We want to provide value um, at multiple scales, so at a more local scale, like an LCC or a state, um, and then uh, as well as region-wide. And lots of work's occurred at this, to this point, <clears throat> but um, lots left to do, of course. All of the geospatial data and metadata are available on the Southeast Conservation Planning Atlas. And uh, that's where you can really begin to get into the data and start to customize uh, your questions and, and what the data can be uh, used to answer. And as I mentioned, there is an update. Uh, version 2.0 will be this fall at, this, at the Southeast Association Conference. Just wanted to touch on a couple um, emerging opportunities or use cases where we've begun to use these tools across state lines, for example, or across ecoregions. Um, one was that was done under the South Atlantic was actually the blueprint used was used to identify areas that could really benefit from prescribed fire. And that was used in a proposal that actually drew uh, new resources from the Resilient Landscapes and Fire uh, program to the, to the Southeast. <clears throat> so monies that, that typically go elsewhere in the country. Uh, we can't talk about the conservation in the southeast, really, without talking about uh, gopher tortoise, which is um, a high priority for state and federal agencies working um, across a, a pretty wide swath of the southeast. And for the last few years, they've been using, depending on which state you were in, different maps and, and different identification of priority areas. And what the CECAS effort has done is help facilitate that work across state boundaries, so they're <clears throat> using similar information. And uh, CECAS really brings the science support of the LCCs and climate science centers into that gopher tortoise effort. So again, just an example. And then this is one sort of closer to, to your neck of the woods. This is the ecological systems work that's been, uh, was initiated by Texas Parks and Wildlife with um, Amy Truer Kane and, and Dwayne German and, and Dave Diamond. And then uh, what we wanted to do was include that, move that sort of into Oklahoma so they were looking at uh, similar information across those state lines. And I believe at the last Great Plains meeting, they talked also about uh, doing a similar effort in, into Kansas and Nebraska, sort of that swath of the central part of the of the country. So again, another example of sort of how we're beginning to work in, in the absence of those geopolitical boundaries, I guess. So just a, a, some of the progress that we've made since the, the CIAFWA summit, uh, summit at CIAFWA last fall. We just held a lead coordination team meeting in, in March. So that includes the science coordinators and coordinators of the LCCs, 
as well as our liaisons to state aid and federal agencies. And we also had some additional folks there this last time, um, Kelly Myers from the Eastern Tallgrass Prairie Big Rivers, uh, Mark Humpert with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, so looking at that national perspective. And then we've also started uh, focusing more on the human aspects of conservation. So we brought in some additional resources from the state agencies, um, who, uh, folks who are working on human dimensions. We've also um, committed to developing an engagement strategy uh, that we'll roll out uh, sort of this, this fall as well. We're working on that now. And so that includes both in reach within the organizations that are already engaged uh, to make sure that they're all up to date on kind of what's happening and that we're uh, getting feedback regularly and improving over time. And then outreach, so beyond the 15 states, so uh, efforts like what we're doing today with uh, webinars in other LCCs, uh, conferences, other venues like that. We just had the, the Southeast Association's directors meeting in April, and a motion was put forth um, for them to contribute resources to a full-time CECUS coordinator position. Uh, currently, I'm in sort of wearing two hats as the CECUS coordinator as well as the Gulf liaison um, person for the Gulf Coast Prairie and Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks, LCCs. Uh, so really what we want to do is um, was recognize that we need to have a full-time position um, sort of continuing to shepherd this effort. So uh, the CAFO director uh, committed to that in April. The federal agencies, the Southeast Natural Resource Leadership Group, they're meeting later this month and will also be discussing uh, contributions. So just a, a couple things on what's next. Um, one of the early projects that came out of this is, uh, we call it the Vital Futures Project, which was funded through the Southeast Climate Science Center. So they're looking at state wildlife action plans across this, the 15 states of the Southeast and and how those might, may or may not have addressed uh, long-term issues like climate change. And then they're also going to be doing some scenario work on uh, climate change that we can begin to build into future iterations of the blueprint in order to uh, address sort of what that landscape um, could look like given different scenarios. So that project was initiated in September of 2015 and will wrap up in September of 2018. So um, they will also be having a special uh, symposium on that at the Southeastern Conference this year to get some um, additional information and input. We will again uh, at the conference this fall be having um, a symposia on aligning actions for success where we're focusing on some of the state agency issues at, at this venue, and we're co-producing the symposium with the, with the Southeast Association's Wildlife Diversity Committee. Um, so if any of you are interested in attending that, the, the website is here. And uh, it's really a very good conference. It's going to be in Louisville, Kentucky this year at the end of October. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we, we want to have, we're working on this model of continual improvement, so expansion of the model um, or into the Northeast and the, and the Midwest. The Midwest Association's already talking about potentially doing something there. And, and really we want to continue to foster this whole concept of peer learning and, and learning from others on the landscape scale, on, on lessons learned on both the conservation component and the, the technical side of it, as well as the collaboration side. So what's been working in your partnership or, or what hasn't, and, and where do you need help? So that we're really focusing on that in the next year as well. Connecting up with other regional efforts, there's some, some great work going on in the Northeast Regional Conservation Framework. So we're working with those folks pretty closely as well as um, the Gulf hypoxia work that's being led out of the eastern tallgrass prairies, big rivers here, um, but definitely, obviously, affects the, the Gulf Coast and, and the work that we do in sort of this bottom end of the watershed. 
And then the, there, there is an, a focus on an emerging Midwestern effort as well. So continued engagement really is key. We're, we're focusing on this a lot. Uh, there's the LCC partnerships. There's the Southeast Aquatic Resource Partnership, the Climate Science Centers. All of those have their own constituents, so to speak. There's continued uh, momentum and improvement on those blueprints at individual LCC levels as well as CECAS wide across the Southeast. We do a lot of um, website and, and conservation planning atlas updates. I'll show you the address for those again here in a few minutes. And then we're always looking for feedback on, on communications. We send out information through various LCC newsletters. I send a monthly um, email blast to about 270 people. In fact, I sent the, the May one just went out this morning. Uh, so if folks are interested, they can get those as well. And we're always looking for ways to improve that. So there's a lot of information on the, the seekistsoutheast.org website, including some of the use cases that I just was able to touch on quickly. Uh, the partners are, are listed, the state and federal agency contacts on that website. Um, and then we're also, the communications team is, is working on some improvements to that. And so it'll be uh, improved here again over the next uh, few months, looking at things like blogs and how to better inform people on upcoming events, those kinds of things. I mentioned the, the monthly emails that come from me. Uh, my email address is there. If you want to get added to that list, please just let me know and uh, I can do that. Or you can contact like your like Genevieve or, or someone else in the LCC world. And then this is our, our crew uh, from last last fall's summit, and uh, Genevieve, that's, that was my last slide, so I'd uh, be interested if there's any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, so folks, if you have any questions, um, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. Um, while they do that, Cynthia, I actually do have a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, the first one is actually, how did the team determine economic incentives for conservation? So that was just um, that was just an example of some identifying some of the agricultural lands that could be um, converted back to their natural state based on uh, capacity. Uh, so I would have to get Rua to actually explain in more detail. <laughs> Um, that but example, it, but really what we were trying to do was illustrate how when you begin to peel back those layers of data, you can use it to answer more specific questions. Uh, we were finding that there's a lot of blue on that on the overall map, right? So when people would look at it, it was overwhelming and couldn't really begin to get their heads around how they would use it, so we developed that example. And was it specific to just agricultural lands or other potential lands, um, working landscapes, for instance? That, could... uh, that example, I think, focused on cropland specifically. OK. Um, and then I had another question um, about if conservation easements were considered um, as protected, that green part on the map. And mostly that was just a question um, about, well, related to really how, maybe a few more details about how you guys have actually tried to work with private landowners or how you're trying to addressing those private lands. Yeah, so the, the green on the map that I showed is just publicly held land. It doesn't get into private conservation easements. Just again, um, as an illustration, I guess, uh, of of the amount of public land that's out there. Mm -hmm. But yes, given where where we work and um, the amount of private land, conservation easements are certainly a, a, an important tool in our, our toolbox. And one of the things that we're working on, especially on the Gulf Coast, is, is with the Nature Conservancy on their recent open spaces project, for example, that helps identify important areas uh, to protect along the Gulf Coast that are 
um, in really high flood prone areas and also have a, a high potential for conservation to, to occur there. So they're not so urbanized, for example, that there's, there's kind of nothing left. So they've done that work uh, and it will identify kind of those existing open spaces that should be prioritized for conservation easements or purchase in some cases. But I think they focus primarily on easements. Um, and then some of the other partners who work with us, the Gulf Coast Land Trust Alliance and uh, Ducks Unlimited and TNC, they, they all use um, conservation easements in their work. And really what a lot of this information is doing is helping them identify where the, the most opportune places are to do that work. Uh, that might be because of a multitude of species that it affects. It might be because it's um, in closest proximity to, you know, to build that network of uh, conservation areas through a region. There's a host of factors that go into that. But yeah, conservation easements are a really important tool for us in the southeast. And then um, just lastly, I wonder if you um, might just share kind of maybe your key lessons learned from working across this large landscape and with such a diverse group of people? So I, I think one of the key things for, for me as sort of the coordinator of this is, is just the not underestimating the amount of time it takes to just coordinate and talk to people and um, gather input and sort of keep all the, the pieces moving. Um, within CECUS, within sort of that lead coordination team that I mentioned, we do things like we have our own regular monthly calls. We've broken up the, the workload, so to speak, into what we call essential work areas. And I didn't get into that today uh, in part because of time, but just quickly those essential work areas are focused on, the first one's focused on the blueprint. So the, the science coordinators and the, the SARP uh, folks are focusing on that continued improvement of the blueprint as well as the, the monitoring of sort of how as we improve conservation delivery or incorporate conservation delivery, how that actually benefiting the outcomes that we want for fish and wildlife. Uh, the second essential work area is the whole area of engagement and communications. So we have a communications group that meets regularly on the phone as well. And they're working on that engagement strategy that I mentioned. They've also been instrumental in doing things like the website. Um, the third one is focused on governance and decision frameworks, so better understanding where conservation decisions are, are made. Um, so who who's affecting that landscape that we're interested in and how those decisions are made. So that kind of gets into the whole aspect of the human dimensions or human aspects of that. And then the last essential work area is really focused on things like the um, updates at the at the CAFWA conference or um, the North American conference that I mentioned earlier that we're going to, to put in for and, and really making sure that we have a tight link to those those sort of outreach opportunities. So I think the those are really some of the, the lessons learned is this group of individuals you see on the screen we're in pretty constant contact and and uh, working closely through the LCC partnerships and making sure that those steering committee members are engaged and updated as well. Um, it's a lot of talking on the phone. <laughs> I, and I think um, Rua would know, and the science coordinators no doubt would have a slightly different answer. Um, you know, we've got some advantage in some of those models that came out of the Southeast Climate Science Center on the urbanization and, and sort of that climate science that are trying to do more of that at a regional effort to begin with so that we don't later on have to stitch things together. Great. Thank you. Um, Ashwin, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just unmute folks on the phone um, and we can ask if there's any questions. Hello. <clears throat> We've disabled lecture mode and anyone in the audience can now ask a question. Great. 
anybody um, on the phone who would like to ask a question? And I know it's a lot of information. I'd, I'd really encourage folks to um, either reach out to, to one of us or, or look at the website. There's, they put together a great story map on that website that uh, highlights some of those use cases in, in a lot more detail. So. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia. It was um, a great presentation. Um, I do think that definitely taking a look at those use cases would be um, additional action that we could take um, also, especially in trying to learn from some of your communication techniques. That is, of course, a big um, hurdle across such a large landscape with so many people to make sure that we're communicating effectively. And so those are all some of the things that we would like to make sure that we're learning from others to implement within the Desert LCC as well. Great. Yep. Um, so again, thank you everybody today for participating. Um, thanks Cynthia for presenting and um, as we noted earlier, the webinar was recorded and it will be made available on the YouTube channel um, in about a week. If you have any questions um, in the meantime, of course Cynthia had her email up there. You're free to contact her directly um, or you can contact me and um, I'll put you in touch with the right people. Thank you so much everybody. Have a great day. Thanks Genevieve. Thank you.